So hey everyone, it's Trevor Turnbull here with SportsNetworker.com and I'm really excited to introduce all of you to two guys that are really starting to uh, make some waves in the sports industry, especially as it relates to working with big brands and athletes and integrating social media and all these cool new tools that uh, uh, these, these entities can take advantage of. Uh, Anthony Caponiti and Steve Cobb. How's it going, guys? Excellent. Thank you, Trevor. Thanks for having us. No problem. So, so these guys are co-founders in a company called Activate Social, and we actually connected, geez, it must have been like, it's over two years ago, I think now, isn't it, guys? Yeah. I've been closer to three, actually. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, the time has flown by for sure, but we, uh, we first connected in, in D.C. and Washington, uh, when I was actually out there on a sports trip and we were talking about best practice and the social media side of things and, and I believe you guys were just getting started with the company back then and since That's then right. I've seen you guys grow this company to you know working with Red Bull and a number of high profile athletes and uh, I'm really excited to sit down and chat with you guys uh, not only about how the company started but your own paths into this space and and uh, you know the backstory that's behind that so this is the first ever two-person interview that we've done on Sports Networker <laughs> nice so Take we're gonna up. riff on this and we're gonna we're gonna see how this goes but uh, Anthony let's maybe start with you if you can uh, Take us back a few years and just let us know how did you get into this space and how did you and Steve come together to create this company? Yeah, that's that's great. Um, so it's an interesting story. I mean, I know a lot of the objective of what you're trying to do with these interviews is educate, um, especially younger people trying to break into the industry or, or even you know mid career for that matter. But my path, I think Steve's path as well, he would say is definitely circuitous in a way. I mean, it wasn't a direct path of. I woke up one day and said, you know, I want to break into sports marketing. Um, for myself in particular, I, I was an NCAA athlete, ran track and field at Emory, Division three program, but sports has always been a primary focus of my life. Athlete from day one, competitive from a very young age. Something I'm clearly passionate about <clears throat> was a business school graduate at Emory and came out and, and like a lot of young students coming out of a, a business program, took a job working in strategy and change consulting at IBM. And I was there for, for close to two years and had a very successful career uh, while I was there. Really enjoyed the work I was on. But I was in a very, very, very different sector from you know and, and type of work that I'm doing for today. This was public sector work, um, working with government clients. But with all the lessons learned that I had there and, and you know the visibility that I was given and the project management and the skills, you know, there was a certain need that was unfulfilled and, and other interests that lie. And you know, where the story really starts is that even though Steve and I had been graduate the same year, I had taken a fifth year at Emory because I tore my ACL. So we were actually on different paths. Steve was yeah. a year ahead of me in his career path. I was a year behind. So the staggered ended up being, I think, really what, what begin, is the beginning of the story because Steve's career had taken him in one direction and was really itching to put some ideas that he'd been kicking around into the marketplace. Um, and I have to give him credit. He's, he's the one that talked me in for the ride. So, um, you know, I think Steve can do a good job of really telling us wh where the story begins. Sure. But, you know, in sure. my particular situation, I bridged full-time or, you know, entrepreneurship with a full-time job. And it, it was a heavy load to take. And I think a lot of people have been there before. Yeah. 100-hour weeks, yeah. coffee shops and nights. Um, but, you know, Steve should tell a little bit about the, the full background of where, where it all yeah. starts. And Yeah. So, similar to Anthony, um, I went to... College as, as an athlete, I played basketball at Cornell, and um, I was a psychology major, but didn't really know what I wanted to do with psychology, uh, kind of didn't want to play overseas, so I decided to stop playing after my sophomore year, and then double majored in econ so that I could try to eat my way into a finance job, and luckily, <laughs> I was able to, <laughs> seriously, I was highly underqualified, but through networking and uh, alumni, able to get into an investment banking job. Uh, at Lake Mason in Baltimore. So you know, I just sold the fact that I was a college athlete, that I was local, and I found my way in there. And I just kind of learned as I went along. And I was in the for-profit education industry, which wasn't my selection. It was, it was where I was put in. But I was able to take a lot of, you know, kind of the retail aspect of that industry and, and, and learn a lot. I would have never thought I could have started my own company mm -hmm. until after my two years in investment banking. And the typical career path is usually, at, you know, at the time, you either go into private equity or you go back to B school. 
And I looked a little into private equity, but around that time I was getting a little feisty. I, I didn't really feel like, you know, this is where I should be. I, I kind of want to do something that I loved. The hours were unbelievable in investment banking. Put a lot of toll on, took a lot of toll on me. Yeah. And, you know, I kind of started asking one of the partners at the investment bank about the sports industry and sports marketing in particular. Um, and, you know, it was kind of, he would give me a little advice here and there, but I, it really sparked when I came across a couple websites. And in general, I was just looking at social media, and MySpace was huge at this time. Twitter didn't exist. Facebook pages didn't really, if it, even if, if it did exist, it was it's really groups. Pretty, yeah, yeah. groups and marketing or anything like that. So we just saw an opportunity that there was no athletes on social media whatsoever. In fact, the only people that were doing anything like that were in the Washington, D.C. area. It was Gilbert Arenas and yeah, his blog right. on NBA.com, right. which right. was very you know, popular at the time, and it was groundbreaking. Uh, and then Chris Cooley from the Redskins also created a blog. But like I said, there was no athletes on MySpace. You know, Friendster was the other big network. Um, and so we said, hey, like, why, don't we, why don't we create this service, this platform that facilitates athletes engaging their fans through social media? Because mm -hmm. we're going to make the guess, which we were right, that they're going to get on it. And eventually, they're going to follow musicians' path. We were right. It turns out, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so... We made the right guess and the right prediction, and we, we wanted to be first to market. Yeah. So here's the deal. We, we really didn't know what we were doing. We, you know, I, I said, Anthony, I, I, think I need a partner. You know, here's the idea. He obviously you know, thinks a lot like me and agreed that this had you know, potential. And I said, you know, listen, we, we just need to prove ourselves. Let's build this product, and let's try to get some athletes on the platform, and then get some fans and get funding and grow from there. Yeah. Um, and so I took out all my money that I saved in my 401k. I, I saved the max from my first few years, like I learned in you know personal finance class in Maybe college. Good finance. And then I just took the penalties, took it all out. Luckily, right before the market crashed, so I didn't. Really <laughs> so now you look like a genius. So in one sense, it hurt that, that we tried to start our first startup during the you know the recession. But in the other sense, hey, my money was in me; it wasn't in these other companies. Right. You know, and, and that's one thing that we've learned mm -hmm. is, you know, it, it's, it is a good thing to invest in yourself. And there's a lot of different ways to do that, a lot of different degrees to do that. Yeah. But, uh, you know, so we, we started this website and we knew that typically you're supposed to build a product step by step, you know, come up with a minimum viable product and, you know, don't build too much. But our situation, we wanted to be first to market. We felt we needed athletes and big names on the platform and then to attract fans, like I said, to then attract financing. We didn't have a a record of previous startups or experience that, you know, people would invest in us as individuals, as a team, but we felt that this was the path that was best for us. Yeah. So yeah. along the process of trying to build this product, not having really technical experience and background, being more on the business and marketing side, uh, Anthony and I went through, through some growing pains, but we met a lot of people and we did a lot of very, very valuable networking yeah. and, and, you know, and just learning experience that we couldn't have got from anybody, whether as a mentor or reading in a book or whatever it is, it's just strictly real world learning experiences as an entrepreneur that's taking a risk. Um, and what ended up happening was we, as we were building that out, Twitter came out and Facebook pages really started blowing up and sure enough, athletes were on the internet and we found ourselves trying to tweak the product to catch up and to stay up to date with it, but it was a losing battle really. And um, I'll let Anthony talk about how that kind of rolled into Activate Social. But yeah. uh, that's kind of how we got started. Yeah, so about. let's uh, tell me when did you guys actually, what, when was this? Was it two or three years ago when you guys officially yeah, it, both kind of yeah. dove head first into Activate yeah. Social as a full-time thing? Because I know I can totally relate to this. I'm sure a lot of people that are watching the video can relate to it that, you know, when you start first start that venture, you might be working a full-time job and then putting in your after hours until two in the morning working on your other business, right? Yeah. But there always it's, seems to be that one point. Thing. Yeah, sorry, Anthony. There also seems to be that one point where things start to tip, and you realize that yes, we're on the right path. So, when was that for you guys? Yeah, excellent question. So you're right. It's good to it's good to put context on it. So, we first set out with, with the Starburst venture that was in 2007. So, as Steve said, that's right right before Facebook Pages rolls out, and that's right when Shaq takes to Twitter. So that's the context of, of the timeline. Yeah. Um, we knew we were on at that point. I mean, I remember saying to Steve, "Hey, listen, like, look at the way Shaquille O'Neal is making waves in the headlines." And, and organically, where all these ideas came from is, you know, typically you see that 
the innovation and some of the best ideas come to the sports vertical last. You know, and we kept asking ourselves, why is that? I mean, does it have to be that way? Is it inherent to the business model? Why is it that the music is, is the innovator in the space and entertainment? And there's obvious reasons, right? They were they were forced. They were forced to get creative um, with the revolution of digital music. So I think very quickly we realized that we were on the right path. But as Steve said, and we'll talk about in this, I think is what a lot of people want to hear is that for two people breaking into an industry of which we didn't come out of a program saying, hey, we want to, we're grooming ourselves for sports marketing. We didn't have those internships. You're not in, you're not in the network and you don't have those contacts. Much of what we spent the three, you know, close to three years in building Starburgs, which ultimately ends up becoming Activate Social as it is today as we evolve the business model, was becoming, you know, building that network. Yeah, and that's what I know we want to talk about today because that's really the key to the whole success um, yeah. was breaking down doors and 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 building those contacts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, at Starburbs, I totally forgot about that, but that was where you guys were at when we first met too. Um, I remember you telling me about the right. uh, the platform and the business that you were trying to build, yeah. and and I know we went to a networking event, you and me, Anthony, in New York, and um, I know I still speak to this all the time, the fact that. I saw that these social tools just opened up a whole new world to me that I didn't know existed before. It was breaking down that, you know, gatekeeper mentality where, you know, you could access the right people that could help you get to where you wanted to be, even if you don't know what that opportunity is yet, right? These are people that had experience in the industry already that could, you know, provide guidance and mentorship. And I know you guys have both said mentorship already a couple of times, and we'll talk about that. But, um, you know, the... How was that for you guys back then, like the idea of social media? Obviously, it's a big part of your business right now, but how did that influence the direction of your company from an individual perspective, the whole you know social media boom that happened over the last four or five years? Definitely. Uh, yeah, so we are, like social media is our agency. We are creative yeah. social media marketing agency, essentially. And with the product, Starboards that we were talking about, just as a quick, you know, background, it was a platform that facilitated athletes, you know, use of social media, a post once published everywhere kind of utility so that they could, you know, post a photo or video or blog or whatever, and it would go to their MySpace page and their Friendster and their right. Facebook page, et cetera. Um, and so it was a big idea. It was very ambitious. And along the way, like Anthony said, we met a lot of people. And... He was actually, I think, writing a blog for Starburbs that was, was. was catching on, and he was noticing there was just a lot of traffic, and it was just kind of like a side thing as we were building this product in stealth. And, you know, we also got on Twitter, and Anthony put a lot of effort into it and ballooned up his followers. Um, so we started to see there's definitely a value there, and if he can grow his followers to this many, then imagine what an athlete can do. You know yeah. what I mean? When fans are hinging on every everything they say, everything they do, and they want more insight and more, you know, feel more connected to that athlete off the field. And so what ended up happening was we had an opportunity um, to work with Red Bull as, uh, as kind of an experiment with one of their athletes to activate him through social media. Didn't have any digital presence. Uh, it was Jimmy Rollins of the Phillies. Yeah. Didn't have any digital presence. And we came in, um, built out his Facebook page, got him on Flickr and YouTube, tried to get him on Twitter. But that was something – what was that? I'm sorry, malfunction Skype. Uh, so, <laughs> so we built out those profiles and ended up, you know, doing an activation for him during the World Series. And like I said, that was still kind of as we were doing the other product. And we decided, listen, it's a losing battle. Like, let's just fail forward with this concept. Let's not try to bring this to market where we have to raise funding. We have to worry about maintaining it. Yeah. Let's let's start fresh and create this agency. You know, and the whole point of that was just to make money on the side because there was no revenue model in place for that other company other than getting funding and then down the road possibly getting money. Yeah. But that led into just the agency and services model, um, came up with a new entity, Activate Social. Obviously, in the name, you can tell social was core to what we offer. Um, and a lot of it revolved around you know, activating athletes through their social media channels and helping them build out those properties. Because at the time, many of them just didn't even have them. They weren't on Twitter. They had, you know, very limited or fake, fake Facebook pages. And we knew that there was a huge audience out there. And that's where the fans were, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. And it was just a matter of going out there, establishing the presence, and then growing those properties. And that proved to be a very, you know, 
successful model. And you know, with Red Bull, we grew. They as they brought on more athletes, they looked to us to do that for them. And um, luckily, we had we got to work with a lot of athletes that were on the big stages of all Super Bowl, World Series, um, you know, NBA championship, yeah. and we were able to do a lot of activations that got a lot of attention um, in the media and. One of the things we pride ourselves on is, is trying to be the first to do something. So, you know, we were big on Foursquare and Facebook Places and checking in. So yeah. we ran first ever athlete um, Foursquare contest and Facebook Places contest. Foursquare was with, was with Rajan Rondo uh, called Goose Ball. And Facebook Places was with Tim Lincecum called uh, Striking. So I'll let Anthony kind of take over. But that's social media, as you can tell, was our core service offering yeah. and beyond the company, beyond what the company is doing, personally we were really you know, establishing our individual um, followings and profiles you know, within those networks and those channels and platforms and it really helped grow you know, connections with people like you and, and other individuals. It's a very close-knit community in sports and social media, yeah. more so okay. than like music and social media. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been valuable on multiple fronts and it really is who we are. So. So speaking of the, the business side of things then, you guys have obviously uh, done some amazing stuff with Red Bull as a client and you mentioned that, you know, I noticed it seems like, you know, once every couple of months you guys get a new athlete on board that is, uh, you know, rising up in their sports and, and really becoming a face for Red Bull and there's kind of two aspects to it, right? There's the athlete themselves and getting them familiar with and comfortable uh, using the tools and then there's also coming up with creative ideas on how you can leverage that audience so that Red Bull can see some type of benefit from it, whatever it happens to be. Um, when you guys first started, let's let's go uh, back to like working with Jimmy. Um, did he have? You mentioned that he didn't really have any presence on Facebook. How much work did you guys have to do to actually train him on how to use these tools, or were you guys managing a lot of that stuff for them, for the athletes yeah. in particular? It's a great question, right? Because inherent in that is is the growth of the industry and the value that comes. And, and the answer is that we did have to do a lot of work. Um, he himself, his agency, were interested, and that's why Red Bull, you know, beyond the fact that they wanted to activate this athlete, had an opportunity to bring one of their first athletes in the fold. They, they had already signed Reggie Bush, and Reggie was active, but there was really no formal relationship. Jimmy and his agency understood early on the value of Facebook, but there was there was a, a, an element of unknown. Like, mm -hmm. what is really the point of Twitter? What is my time going towards? Why do people want to hear about what I'm having for lunch? You know, the classic things you're used to hearing about early yeah. in the industry. So, yes, I mean, there very much was, um, you know, an early learning period of saying, what is the value here? What are we all trying to work towards and what's the goal? At the same time, we were falling into it really quick. I mean, that was the name of the game back in 2000, 2007, 2008, yeah. getting on there and just experimenting. So, we can't we can't make up the fact that yes there was some experimentation involved but certainly I think very quickly both Jimmy as the athlete and the agency quickly understood the value because as Steve mentioned what ends up being a catalyst for much of our future success was that the Phillies made a run into the World Series and we ran a promotion at the time um, looking for you know Jimmy's top fans. And this was even actually, believe it or not, before Facebook had formal guidelines. Without going into details, I mean, it, was, it wasn't a very complicated promotion, but what, what that bore out was the inherent value of the fan-to-athlete relationship, yeah. the value of why it's worth the time to invest your money, both from a sponsor perspective to activate, and both from an athlete and a management's perspective. Yeah. And, and that was really the, case, really the case study that proved it all. I mean, the World Series was a great breeding ground. Yeah. You actually bring up a great point. I totally forgot about this, but I wanted to to mention it too. Um, you guys have had some uncanny uh, uh, things happen as it relates to which athletes you're working with and the stage that they end up being on. I know I've noticed that like with Reggie Bush, for example, and the Saints go and win the Super Bowl, right? I think you guys, yeah. didn't you launch a, a Facebook photo contest or something a couple of weeks? Yeah. Right before Dude, the Super can. Bowl? Yep, that's right. We, yeah. uh, just to tell you the story real quick, so... Jimmy, we start with Jimmy went to the World Series that year, and uh, you know, obviously, that's what Anthony was talking about was experimental. And so, we were given the opportunity to work with Reggie Bush, who had, I believe, at the time, over a million Twitter followers, but no Facebook page. Yeah. So, yeah. we got him on Facebook for a few months leading up to the playoffs, and he grew to about seventeen thousand fans. And then, uh, 
first game of the playoffs, he comes running out of the tunnel with a wooden bat. Um, and it was something <laughs> that the coach gave to all the players, gave him a wooden bat that said, bring the wood. And that was the playoff model, you know, for that Super Bowl winning season. And Reggie just really loved it. And so a lot of what we try to do is be clever and, you know, take something that recently happened and activate around that. And it's around a big event. And that's a time when fans are going to be engaged, when your properties are susceptible to growth and spikes in growth at that. Um, it takes a lot of groundwork. You have to lay the groundwork to be able to activate and take advantage of those opportunities. But yeah. we saw this as something where we pitched just a, you know, pretty much a basic, basic Facebook photo contest back when, I mean, let's be honest, there was less traffic in the news feed and you got more, you know, more comments and more stories related to things you did into the news feed. So it allowed things to grow and pages to grow faster and quicker. It's not mm -hmm. the same nowadays. But the contest was called Who Dat Fan, you know, based yes. off of Who Dat, the uh, you know, New Orleans Saints motto or, you know, rally cry. And we just chose one of a judge's selection, one photo that had the most fan votes and then another randomly and gave them all a Red Bull branded autographed uh, baseball bat that said Bring the Wood. Yeah. And that thing grew it from, grew his page from 17,000 to 250,000 in a 45-day period. Wow. Now, we don't take full credit because the fact that they wanted to, went to the Super Bowl and won it <laughs> really just drove a lot of yeah, that. Yeah, that maybe has nothing to do with it. It was all you guys. Maybe 100 <laughs> instead of 200 yeah. And that thing went on, and he was the most popular NFL athlete on Facebook. Yeah. But, so, but, I mean, but, but you're right. I mean, yeah. there, there, there was a crazy run, and we can't, we can't take credit for that necessarily. That's, that's the good folks at Red Bull signing people, but... You know, it was Jimmy in the World Series, and then it was Reggie in the Super Bowl, and Rajon wins, the, you know, goes to the NBA Finals, and then, of course, they get back. So, I mean, and, 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 you know, it's been talked about before. Um, I mean, Red Bull's just had an uncanny run. We can't take that away from them. But yeah. there's, there's obviously method to the madness in their science. Like, yeah. they have timing. Sure. No doubt. And, and that, they put it to work so that they could take advantage of those yes. opportunities. Yeah. yeah. No, and that's what I was going to say about that, too, is that there's no doubt that, you know, it's it's impossible to script some of the things that have happened over the past couple of years. Sure. But at the same time, because of the fact that you guys have your finger on the pulse of what that next big thing might be or how you can get more engagement from the fans by tapping into something that's very timely, um, you saw the results, right? And that... I think speaks to the the new model that you guys have created in your you know agency, if you want to call it that. Um, you know, it's it's a new model. It's not the old school model where you're putting together strategies that were based on uh, traditional media that hasn't changed a whole lot over the last forty years, right? The stuff that you're doing is reactive, and it's and there's something new every day. Like you see, Pinterest comes out, and all of a sudden there's this big explosion on Pinterest, right? And I I have no I, I, idea what you guys have uh, upcoming here. In the future, but I know in the past I've seen campaigns where you guys have used Foursquare uh, before people were even considering using that as a, a marketing tool, right? So um, you guys got to take a little bit of credit there. It's it's not all luck, right? No, no, no. I mean, you raise a very valid point, and you know, part part of the interview is also to educate people on you know our our path, the industry, and, and the evolution of the model, and of course. You always have to take credit where credit's due, but like anything else in life, timing makes a difference. And yeah. you know, in our first effort, the timing just wasn't there. But with with the evolution of our understanding of the business model and the timing, it all started to click. And yes, you're correct. I mean, in this industry, I think what's paramount is the balance between forward looking and keeping your foot, you know, where today is. And, yeah. and because our industry is quite overwhelming, you can get on Mashable and your head can explode, right? Okay. It's just that simple. How many new people are coming in the space, all the different ventures? And you bring up Pinterest. You bring up Google+. Plus. I mean, these are, these are great points. And what an agency like ourselves has had so much success doing is be, finding the balance of trailblazing yeah. you know, with a strategy that is achieving the goals of the client. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, and, again, the key there is goals. And I think too often there aren't proper legs that are given to a promotion in this space and making sure that PR is supporting it, um, that you've, you know, have carved out a certain percent that's going to be experimental. But ultimately, you know, to really get to your point, that's the key. We, we hinge on creativity, and that's what makes us successful. Yeah, and just to piggyback, that is it's kind of the essence of this, this industry that we're in is it's constantly evolving, and the landscape is just so dynamic that you can't be experts in social media, mm -hmm. you, you know, because it's always evolving, it's always changing. So 
one of the things that it does is like on one hand, yeah, that's that's you know a con because we can't establish ourselves necessarily, you know, as the leaders in this space because there's always people you know pushing up against us and there's always Facebook makes changes called timeline, you know what I mean, to yeah. the brands and everything we've done up until now has to be rethought and reworked, etc. Yeah. But on the other hand, it always as long as we're creative and as long as you know we are constantly thinking of you know what's on the cutting edge and everything, keeping uh, abreast of all the new platforms and what opportunities they present, what type of fan demographic that would reach, you know, then we can stay ahead of the game. And I think that's, that's, I like the challenge, you know, it keeps you on your toes. And that's another thing where you know, people looking to get in the industry, there's just so much opportunity, whether it's you know, take, creating an agency of your own or stepping into a role that never existed before for a team or an organization. You know, the young people, this generation is a generation that lives and breathes social media. It's, you know, it's a natural extension of who they are and their identity. And so the generation that's, you know, the C level can't say the same for them. They look for the younger people, you know, the people in their twenties and thirties to lead up digital efforts and social media campaigns and, I think that's a huge opportunity for, for people looking to get into the sports industry, whether it's on an internship or, you know, paid basis, mm -hmm. social media, that is. Yeah, and so I'll bring it back to talking about you guys as individuals, um, as co-founders of the company, too. Uh, you mentioned that, you know, all of these resources are out there for people to educate themselves on uh, these new tools and, and how these are evolving into new roles essentially with sports teams and agencies and that type of thing. Um, what do you guys do typically? Like where do you spend most of your time in keeping up with the latest news and, and finding those people that are, uh, you know, writing about the, the latest trends and all that kind of stuff? What's, what's your guys' go-to tools? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a great question and I think you'll appreciate this answer. Um, <laughs> blogging. Yeah. Blogging. I, I, you know, I'm a firm believer in learning by doing. Um, and, and I hope this is true when, I'm, when we're sitting down and doing an interview for you know three years from now. But we believe in rolling up our sleeves every single day, you know, while managing the business, and, and that's how you learn. So, frankly, you know, I'm still actively blogging, putting out, trying to put out thought leadership in the space on, on our Activate Social blog, which has got a great reputation. Um, but that's how I learn. You know, I pick. You know, you're looking to grow in an area to to inc you know learn more about your weaknesses. What better way than to get out there and write about it? Um, it's it's cathartic to begin with, and it's yeah. a great way to learn. And that inherent research is really, to be honest with you, that's where it comes from. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's learning by doing. Yeah, and uh, Anthony is more active on the company blog than I am. Um, you know, I should be more active, but does a good job of that. I do a lot of reading. So I, sports networker, somewhat, <laughs> it's definitely a publication that I, I go to a lot and I visit. Or all these plug. other, you know, the match bubbles. <laughs> uh, yeah, shameless plug. Um, hey, you got to throw it in. But it's true, you know, to be honest. And so we also, we have an industry newsletter that our, our employees put together. And luckily they go out and they do the work to find all the latest sports and social media news stories. And I can, you know, I have a little cheat sheet. I can go and just check it out from there. But yeah. beyond just staying up to date, you know, with what, what's new in terms of news and blogging, like a lot of what we do is campaigns and promotions and activations. And for me, like most of my time is spent checking out other activations, other contests, seeing how brands, not even in the sports space, are creatively engaging right. their fans mm -hmm. through different platforms. Right now, you know, Pinterest is labeled as a fem you know, female demographic, you know, majority. And so where it fits in the sports industry is more along the lines of, okay, we've got a women's club of fans, let's figure out how to, you know, leverage Pinterest to reach them and better form a relationship with them. Or, like I use the example, um, Under Armour's, they have a big plans for their female apparel line. I think it's going to outsell their male apparel line. And Pinterest is a platform that they could definitely get involved more with. But with that said, um, you know, I think that we're, I'm just keeping an eye on what maybe a brand that's in fashion or, you know, another industry that makes sense for Pinterest right now. Yeah. What are they doing? How are they leveraging that? Because eventually, it's gonna it's gonna be more relevant to sports. Um, you know, and a lot of our ideas are are kind of tweaked from other ideas that we've seen from other agencies or other brands. Um, you know, it's not necessarily just you know, out of thin air. Yeah, and, and I think I think too, Trevor, you always got to give credit where credit's due. I mean, that's the beauty of an agency model. Um, we have a lot of bright people here that work with us. And to say that I learn everything on my own is certainly I rely on a lot of other bright minds because, yeah, yeah. as I said, your, your mind will explode. No doubt. 
No doubt. And to give the shout out right back to you guys, I know us at Sports Networker, we follow what you guys to stay up on trends. And I think that's the important thing to get from all this is that you don't have to be the be all expert in everything, right? There's there's so many smart people out there that are, you know, everybody's researching their own thing and finding a different spin on how something's done and how it might relate to future campaigns or trends and that type of thing. And that's one of the most important things I know that we try and um, relay to people that follow our blog is that these resources are available to you if you just go out and follow them. But if you can actively get involved and, and write on your own, you know, have your own opinion on something, write, start a blog, um, it establishes expertise. And I'm sure you guys can attest to this now that your company's growing when you're starting to hire people. Um, I know for us, whenever we're screening, we're looking to see what are these people talking about? Are they actively yes. using the tools that we're going to be hiring them um, to to use for the business as well? Would you guys agree with that? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, you bring up a valid point because, you know, one thing that I, I really, really believe in is, you know, giving back to the community. And you can't hire everybody. Not everybody can be an intern, but you can certainly give your time back because, I, you know, we've had people that helped us along the way. But... I think you really hit home something that's very important, and that is it, it is an industry, again, that relies on innovation. So you can't be an expert in everything. You just yeah. simply can't, in my personal opinion. And, and to position yourself that way sometimes can, can be a negative. So I think often in, in our space it's refreshing when people hear somebody say that they have a real niche, you know, mm -hmm. they have a focus and understanding like, I, I get this vertical or, you know, I really, geolocation is my bread and butter. So advice that I would give to somebody, especially breaking into the space is don't feel like you have to be an expert in, in everything that you need to try to be everything to everybody, you know, follow your passion and, and let that take you where it goes because there are so many great opportunities in terms of technology. First of all, you're going down a path that's never going to be successful. You can't be an expert in everything. Yeah. It's really true. Yeah, no, you, that, that's actually one of the questions I was going to ask you guys too because we always ask our, our guests on these interviews to provide some feedback on uh, whether or not you should try and learn a little bit about everything because I know in the sports industry, if you say in general, I want to work in sports, there's a number of areas to work in sports, right? Ticket sales, sponsorship, marketing, the online yes. side of things. Yes. And um, I would say 80% of the time, we always hear from people exactly what you just said, which is... You know, don't get overwhelmed by everything. Try and really become a quote unquote expert in your niche where, you know, an expert is not somebody that learns and now they know everything, but you're constantly learning, right? And I think that's one of the most powerful things about uh, the social media side of things from a personal perspective is that it gives you the resources to learn all the time, right? There's always something Absolutely. new coming out. There's always somebody smarter than you out there that's going to be able to feed you with yep. the latest information and uh, I know that's how it's changed my life, and I, I think you guys can attest to that as well. It is. It's, it's like, it is life-changing, but, you know, entrepreneurship is, is a beautiful thing, right? It's, it's a way to empower your ideas um, and to see your creativity, creativity put into the marketplace and, and to really bring something to life that's your own. But, you know, it's like anything else. As we talked about in the beginning of the story, we didn't come from a sports marketing background. So, so how do you break yeah. in? Well, you break in by doing it. And we rolled up our sleeves. Every day, day in and day out, for you know nearly five years, building an expertise in this space, building relationships, and really beginning to understand what it takes to create an integrated approach and a strategy. And therein is my advice to somebody again, young breaking in space, is that listen, you can't take away the hard work part of the formula. Yeah. I mean, yes, there are there are that you can have a little bit of luck along the way, but it takes hard work. So. Mm -hmm. Recognize that fact and you'll be better for it. And it takes internships. It takes learning by doing. It takes, you know, blogging like you said and learning learning what content management really means and why content's so powerful. And that's my feedback generally. And it, and it really starts there. Learn. Do. The internships, they will grow you. And you have to put in your time. It's part of the, it's part of the way the game works. Um, but I'm a firm believer in opportunities present themselves when you work hard and you put yourself out there. If you never leave your room, never leave the college dorm, you're not going to meet people. If you don't go out, you don't intern, you don't put your time in, that's how you find opportunities. And then guess what happens? Eventually they find you. Yeah. So. yeah. 
the door they're not knocking down your door unless you're out there <laughs> actively yes showing, sir, that's right show who you are and what you know steve what maybe if you can elaborate on that too i know um one of the questions i wanted to ask you guys is, is advice that you guys would give to students or you know just anybody in general that might want to break into the uh the industry uh whether it be networking or you know if education is because i know you speak to this too um the idea that both of you started without the idea that you were going to start a sports company, right? A sports marketing company. Right. Um, what would be your, yep. your number one tip for people uh, on what they should focus on or what might be most helpful for them? It's tough to say what's your number one. I mean, I, one of the things I tell people is it would be on, I'd say it's a given that you should – Network. I mean, networking and having relationships is how what seventy five percent, ninety percent of people get their jobs or people get their business. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of other agencies out there that might be more qualified to do certain work, but other agencies get it because they have a, a pre existing relationship with that client or that brand. And the same, like I got my job in investment banking because a Cornell grad was the one who was recruiting me. Right. You know, being frank. Um, and then I, you know, once I got in, I took advantage of that opportunity. And I leveraged that and I learned a lot and you know, I moved on and et cetera. But getting a lot of experience, the sports industry is very different than any other industry. And it's fun. It's competitive. That means you don't get paid as much. That means you got to do stuff for free. And, you know, in this day and age, teams and, you know, and other sports clients and, you know, different organizations, they, they are always looking for assistance. And, you know, if you can – be somebody who helps them out, volunteers, just something out of the ordinary, not not just a thing that you hear at, you know, your your career counseling class or whatever, but do something that makes you stand out as different, that showcases what you want to showcase your talent in. For instance, if you're trying to get a job in social media, do something creative, think outside the box, you know what I mean? Um, you know, that's that's what stands out to me. But also having a story. Like telling your story, having a reason why somebody you're good for a position, whether it's paid or unpaid. Um, you know, I formulated my story on why I should get into banking because I was an athlete, and that's why I don't have so many internships. You know, because I was dedicated to my sport, and you know, it shows I have a lot of hard work, and, and you know, how it translates. Yeah, yeah, I'm a team player, etc. And then on top of that, you know, I was local, so I played that up, but. Most people don't really have a good grasp on what their best story is when they're trying to talk to an employer, a potential employer, or you know, a sports organization. And you have to just stand out from the pack. I mean, there's so many different ways you can do it now. And I think that that's number one thing is show how you're unique and understand what your story is. Yeah, and I think another good one, Trevor, is that um, there's two things, two quick ones, and I'll keep it nice and short, <laughs> interview style, right? Um, persistence. Because I think... From, and we've all gone through it. We've all graduated from school. We try to break the industry. It's tough when somebody says, oh, go be creative or, or go use these tools you have. Well, easier said than done. Hey, guess what? I sent an interview and nobody paid attention. Mm -hmm. Persistency. Persistency pays off. And, of course, there's a fine line to know when you're bothering somebody first is being productively persistent. But guess what? You can wear people down in a professional manner. Yeah. You can you can put yeah. yourself in a light where somebody can't ignore you anymore. And that, that's happened before. We've had interns come to us that way. Um, and guess what? If, if you're good and you know you're good and you have skills you contribute, somebody's going to take note of that because people are looking for talent. They're looking for bright minds. And eventually somebody will, will see that and take advantage of it. And, and the other thing is it's the small stuff. You know, if you have an about me page and it just shows off your handles and that you're actually using these different mediums, that goes a long way. Yeah. It goes a really long way if you're breaking the social media, just that entry to say, okay, I get it. Yeah. They, they, yeah. they, at least they understand the scene. Now let's look a little deeper. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One, la one last thing. <laughs> and this is, this is kind of something you might not hear normally, but knowing who you should create relationships with, not just networking, but being smart about your networking, and you can obviously network at scale with these different social media channels, but I mean, yeah, there's somebody who's in charge of the internships at the Washington Redskins, for example. But, you know, that's really maybe only helpful for the Washington Redskins. And there's tons of people like you that are trying to get in touch with that person. But maybe somebody that owns an agency or that is just very influential, uh, you know what I mean, build that has tons of followers on Twitter. If you build a relationship with them, they talk to everybody and they'll, 
They'll definitely you know, recommend you to the people. A lot of our interns have come through recommendations of peers that we have in the industry that we have relationships with through social media. So being smart about who you want to form relationships with and being, being genuine and just offering value, helping them just to help them. Yeah. These people are popular for a reason. They have a lot of followings for a reason, followers for a reason, because they're good at relationships. And they won't forget you. That's yeah. right. So. Those are awesome tips, guys, and I, I will just elaborate on one of them because it just sparks uh, something that I've experienced myself, too, in hiring people for different roles. Um, it's amazing how far it goes when, you know, if somebody goes through a traditional process of submitting an application and, and s sending in their resume and that type of thing, but then they follow up on Twitter or they send you an email, even just anything to kind of stand out above the crowd, right? A lot of times... Um, you know, people will just send in that resume and then sit and wait. And that proactive nature, I think, for me, I know that it, it makes me realize that these people are willing to go that extra mile and be proactive to get something that they want. And when I see that, I can also translate that into them making my life easier for the role that I want to hire them for, too. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. And I can give you a great example, Trevor. Um, the, the panel that I spoke on for Social Media Week in New York City was organized by Tyler Becker, a student that I believe is a sophomore at NYU in Stern. And, I mean, he's a fantastic kid. He's an example of somebody that's really already at a young age understood not only the value of networking but, but timing uh, um, and his follow-up steps. Like you said, I received a shorthand written note, you know, right to the point, two lines and a thank you. And I, it's funny because I actually heard somebody say, oh, you shouldn't send out handwritten notes because that's tacky. That's BS. Oh, because totally. how many times have you ever received a handwritten note from a sophomore in college? So just you know, having that understanding, having that savvy and that follow-up and, and really taking pride in your own reputation, it carries, it, it carries volumes about somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no doubt. He writes for Sports Networker as well. <laughs> He's very proactive right. in a number of different right. ways. You're right. I didn't know that. I yeah. forgot about that. Yeah. No, that was we, not a like, oh, coincidence. <laughs> But we see that constantly too with a lot of our authors. We have a number of people that write for the site and the ones that see the most return off of the time that they invest to write articles for the site are the ones that are proactive in their approach, right? They actually uh, go above and beyond to try and learn, uh, to understand, you know, like we, we do these interviews, for example, like we're doing right now. Uh, we have uh, a guy by the name of Sam Miller, who's an author on our site, who proactively approached me and said, I want to do those kind of interviews too. I will take 10 minutes out of my time to show him how to do it. And when he does that, he's now put himself in a position to connect with whoever uh, he wants in the sports industry, essentially. So that proactive nature can go a long ways and thinking outside the box on how you can actually you know, make yourself stand out. So these right. are... Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just saying, yeah, I just, you couldn't have said it better. I mean, that's just as articulate as it gets, Trevor. I mean, learning, I say it again, but, and I think I stole it from Steve, actually, but learning by doing. I mean, yeah. that's just the way it works. Put yourself in a position to learn, interview people, write blog posts, whatever it may be, because, again, if you're stuck in one role or you don't get outside of your room, you're never going to learn, and that's yeah. the only way that you're going to find opportunities. I mean, couldn't have said it better. No doubt. This has uh, been an awesome interview so far, guys. I want to end things off with uh, tapping into your brains a little bit about the next biggest, greatest thing that you got going on. I know you guys are working with Blake Griffin right now, and uh, mm -hmm. we actually chatted, I think, a couple of months ago. We were going to profile some of the stuff that you guys are doing with him, but um, you guys are always pushing the envelope, it seems, to come up with the latest um, thing that's that's you know really catching on. So what do you guys got cooking? Can you can re reveal anything to me here today? Well, we can't give you the full story, but we'll give you, yeah, no, we're, we're pretty amped, and um, you know, Steve's the head of product development and, and, and really the one that, that's building out the, the core functionality, but we're amped because we're going to bring a product to the marketplace um, in an area that we think is really underserved right now in sports marketing, um, and, and really the key is building the fan relationship, um, something that is not really being done in an integrated manner, especially when you look on the team side, CMS and relationships. Um, very, very excited about this and something we hope we can bring to market soon. Um, and as far as platforms, I'll tell you, you mentioned it earlier, and I don't want to harp on because everybody talks about it, but Pinterest is hot. Yeah. But I think on you know an area that a lot of people don't talk about, Pinterest brings up um, something bigger. And that is the ownership of images and visual content on the internet. And that's really what Pinterest is driving at is better ownership of that content and what are the call to action. So 
we have some ideas cooking, but I think in the next three to six months, you might see some things where we're trying to drive those call to actions off those visual representations and, and really trying to attach an end, um, you know, an end action from the sports fan of, of what you're driving and what they're ultimately executing on behalf of the team and the athlete. And um, so we got some ideas cooking there. Yeah, I just, just keep it short, but yeah. So as Anthony was talking about, you know, we we have been a services agency mainly, and now. We're starting to, you know, after years of providing services and using third-party platforms, we have a real in-depth understanding of where we think it might be missing a feature that we want or why we're overpaying for something. And it's allowed us to automate a lot of the services that we've done by creating applications that we're licensing out to clients now. And on top of that, we do have a separate product that we have big plans for and we're really excited for. We'll be announcing it very soon. Nice. Um, maybe, so, maybe we can do, yeah. we can do an exclusive one. Hey, <laughs> there we go. Yeah, the, the official reveal. Exactly. Let's make it happen. And, you know, that's good. And we're always keeping our eye on what's hot. And, um, you know, second screen it is, looks like it's pretty popular. Predictive gaming is really yes. big in the sports yes. industry. Yes. Um, as an industry where... I don't want to go on too long, but that was something that existed like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, years ago in sports bars. Yeah. You can sit around, you can predict the next play on Monday Night Football or something. Yeah, yeah, but that's starting to come into social media and mobile, and it really engages the fans during the event, um, you know, both at the event and at home and watching. So, yeah. you know, social media is only amplified TV viewership, and people and advertisers are looking at ways to connect the athletes and the fans even more so with their brand. Yes. Through so second screen. Yes. Well, you third guys. Screen. Yeah, like I said, you guys are, um, you know, at the top of my list of people that I follow to stay up on all these trends. And as you know, it's it's exhausting to try and stay up on everything. But um, by following people that are, you know, taking the lead and and uh, showing the world what can be done, um, you know, you can learn a ton from that. And I'm actually on your website right now looking at a post that you guys wrote on early February on 2012 sports social media predictions. And I believe what you were talking about there. There's some of that stuff in there on gamification and, you know, Google+. Plus. There's so many things that we, we can see coming out here in mm -hmm. the next next um, 8 to 12 months. It's going to be exciting to see. Uh, so you guys got a lot of growth happening right now. And I want to, you know, ask you, how can people find more about you guys? Because I know you guys are expanding and you're in a new office space uh, in Arlington. Uh, how can people find out more about what you got going on and the opportunities that you guys have with the company? Yeah, great question. A um, couple different ways. The website, very, very active there. Um, that's a great way to keep a pulse on, on the campaigns that we're rolling out, the new work we're doing. We're trying to do more and more thought leadership in the space. You brought up the, the predictions. So I yeah. recommend checking out the blog, uh, activatesocial.com uh, slash blog. Also, hashtag sports. We have a daily newsletter. That's a great way. I think that's what you're referring to. Yeah. Like a shameless plug. But, it's a great um, source. You know, it, it's a great great way to keep in touch with you know, industry headlines and what we're doing. Um, and we're very active on all of our social channels. So you know, check out our Twitter. Check out our Facebook. But you know, keep your eye on, on the website. We have all of our, our postings up there in terms of career options. And... Um, that's, that's yeah, I mean, yeah. from an individual perspective, Anthony can be found at Capaniti, C-A-P-O-N-I-T-I -I, on Twitter, and I'm at Steve underscore yeah, Cobb, C-O-B-B, so feel free to tweet us. And then if anyone's going to get South by Southwest, we're going to be representing down there. So. Nice, nice. Yeah, I was hoping to get down there this year. Unfortunately, it's not going to work out, but I would like to connect with you guys at some point over the year. Maybe, you never know, Washington Capitals running the playoffs this year? Hey, yo. Make us a boys. <laughs> Yeah. Late, late, late charge, right? <laughs> What's that? So they're, they're making a late charge. Making a they're late getting... charge, exactly. Yeah, no, I hope that they do. As you know, as you guys know, I got a buddy that works for the team, and I'm long overdue to get out there and, and meet up with him again and, and uh, take in some playoff hockey. So who knows? Maybe we'll meet in your neck of the woods here real soon. Yes, yeah, looking forward to it. Cool. Well, I appreciate you guys doing this. Uh, big thanks. And like I say, I'll follow up and, and we'll do that exclusive interview when you guys are ready to launch that new product you got coming out. Thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Thanks a lot. No problem. Thanks, guys. Take care. Take care.